Bolsters and bastards. And we Bullies, start tonight. Bolsters and bastards. In Isaiah chapter 14, we're actually we're going to start with the bolsters tonight. In Isaiah chapter 14. And in Isaiah 14, starting with verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thy heart, I will ascend unto, the, unto heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also on the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, and I will be like the most high. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. And it's an interesting thing in here. That word in verse 14, heights, uh, if you look it up in the Hebrew, that word is Obama. It's spelled U-G-B-A-M-A. -A. If you take the U-G off, and just B-A-M-A, -A. in the Hebrew, it's the high place or heaven. The first is heaven, and then after that it's a high place. And it's an interesting thing too, because if you go to Ezekiel chapter 20, and in Ezekiel chapter 20 and verse 29, you read this. Then I said to them, what is the name whereunto you go? And the name therefore, is called Bama unto this day. Wherefore say unto the house of Israel, thus saith the Lord God, Are you polluted after the manner of your fathers, and you commit whoredom after their abominations? For when you offer your gifts, and when you make your sons pass through the fire, you pollute yourselves. With all your idols, even unto this day, shall I be inquired of by you, O house of Israel. As I live, saith the Lord God, I will not be inquired by you. And that which cometh unto your mind shall not be at all that you say. We will be as the heathen in the families of the countries to serve wood and stone. Well, it's an interesting thing because when we talk about Obama, here, actually his name is right there, it's spelled differently, but Obama, and the word there means the elevated one, the elevated one. And if you uh, go to uh, Luke chapter 20, it's an interesting thing in Luke 20. No, I'm sorry, Luke 10, verse 18. Yeah, Luke. Chapter 10, I believe it is, verse 18. <clears throat> and he said, And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Well, if you look that word up, lightning, both in the Hebrew and the Aramaic, it's Barak. I beheld Satan as Barak. Fall from, and guess what the heaven there is? The word is Bama. In the Greek, you have Solar in the Hebrew. So, I saw Satan as lightning, as Barak, fall from Obama. That's interesting, isn't it? Hmm. But anyhow, going back to Isaiah 14. Now, here old Satan makes a boast. Hmm. And his boast is that he's going to ascend above the heights of the clouds. And he's going to be as the most high. Well, Dr. Shannon, we know of some others that have made such boasts. That fellow called Karl Marx. He said that he would rise up out of the ashes and he would ascend to be equal with God and he would take his gloved fist and shake it in the face of the world and then he would be God. But I don't think he made it. No. He didn't make it. And then we had another, a fellow named Saul Olinsky. Now Saul Olinsky, he dedicated his book that he wrote uh, to Satan. And in there, in the intro, he says, to the, to the first real and greatest revolutionary rebel, Satan, he, Lucifer, he donated, he dedicated his book to Lucifer. Now, he was Hillary Clinton's 
role model and his idol and Barack Obama's too. Where I come from, if your hero is a Satan worshiper, you're a Satan worshiper. I wonder how he's doing today. Uh, I don't think he has any lack of, uh, of hating he is. Mm -hmm. I think he's in a warm climate. <laughs> and then, so he did some boasting in uh, both of them and, well, talks cheap, isn't it? <laughs> then if you turn over to Genesis chapter 9, there's another fellow, old Nimrod. Old Nimrod wanted to have a new world order. And uh, uh, he wanted to build a, a tower all the way to heaven and challenge God. And uh, his agenda really was no different than that of the United Nations, is it? And we read, starting in verse 11, And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass, as they journeyed from the east, that they found a plain in the land of China, and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and slime, as they for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build a city and a tower, whose top may reach into heaven. And let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower where the children of men build it. And the Lord said, well, The people is one. They have all one language, and thus they begin to do. And now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down and there, confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence and upon all the face of the earth, and they left to build a city. Therefore is the name of, the, of it called Babel, because the Lord did their confound. language of all the earth. And from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of the earth. Well, uh, God's intention from the beginning when he gave us the institution of human government was for them to take what was what was the very first very first command that God gave man. Be fruitful and multiply. To be fruitful and fill the world. To be fruitful and fill it. To send them out to be fruitful and fill the world. Now again, their their agenda was really no different than the United Nations and what we have today, this whole new world order agenda. So when he did some boasting, and there was a if we turn over to the book of Job, and we read in Job. Now, Satan, the word Satan means the adversary or the accuser, the accuser. And just as Satan accuses us before the Lord, Satan's children accuse us of being narrow-minded. Now, I plead guilty to being narrow-minded mm -hmm. because we're to be, what, focused, focused mm -hmm. upon the Lord's work, right, upon the Word of God. Amen. But they also accuse us of being homophobic. Do we have any homophobes in here? Okay. Those, they're Christophobic, okay? Right. <laughs> uh, you're not really a, afraid of them, are they? You no. preach the gospel. Right. They're Christophobic, and uh, they accuse us of being racist. I don't think there's any more racist group out there than the NAACP. Oh, man, okay. uh, exactly. They accuse us of being intolerant. Well, there was no man that ever walked the earth when it come to what they practiced that was any more intolerant than the Lord Jesus himself. Oh, man. He, he was more intolerant of sin than anyone ever walked the earth. And the earth, the world will find that out in spades when he returns, won't they? Oh, man. Well, they, they refer to us as being bigoted. And if you take a look at it, every one of these are characteristics of liberalism, aren't they? Amen. All of the things, under liberalism, they will always accuse you of doing what it is they do. This is right in 
the Karl Marx playbook, right out of communism, always accuse the opposition of doing what you're doing. And we know that in, in Isaiah 32, verses 1 through 8, talks about the Lord's return for the millennial kingdom. And he said just prior to that, what? Well, the person, the vile person would be called a liberal. The vile person, and what would they do? They would embrace hypocrisy. Always doing the opposite of what they say. Say one thing and do another. Now, let me ask you this. Have you noticed that about Obama? Uh, I can't when, uh, oh, yeah. That was one of the things Sarah Palin did when she talked about uh, the health care. If you like your doctor, you can't have your doctor. And if you, what is it? All, well, she just went through a litany of all of the things that he said and then wouldn't do. And here now, we, we read in Job, starting at verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Well, Dr. Shannon, there's a lot of people that get a little confused with that passage. Uh, they, they get the idea that somehow Satan is still in heaven. But Satan isn't in heaven. In fact, we have three heavens out there. The Bible talks about three heavens. And when the Son of God come, uh, the sons of God come before God. Well, uh, folks, uh, you can be right where you're at and, and be before God. And so, and besides that, they had uh, ways of uh, telecommunications that are far more sophisticated than what we have today. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered, the Lord said, From going to and fro on the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? Now you know what? That could have happened to any of us, huh? Job is truly an upright man. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Ha! Does Job fear God for naught? Hast thou not made a hedge about him that, and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth thy hand now and touch all that he hath and he will curse thee to thy face. Let me ask you this. Do you think God knew the heart of Job? Yep. Does God not look upon the hearts? So he's Satan is making an accusation, <coughs> and he's kind of going against a stacked deck in a way, isn't he? Yeah. You know, it's an interesting thing because the Bible talks about uh, God's pavilion where he meets, and uh, where Satan meets in his pavilion with all of his... Uh, angels where he, he meets to plan his battle strategy and God setting in on the meeting. It's awful hard to, to win a war when you're going to be setting in on your planning sessions, right? Amen. He says, and the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power, only upon him himself, put not forth thy hand. So Satan went forth in the presence of the Lord. There was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking in their eldest in their eldest brother's house. And there came a messenger to a Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the asses feeding beside them. And the Sabians, well, they fell upon them and they took them away. Yes, they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword. And I, only I, escaped alone to tell them. And while he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The fire of God! It's fallen from heaven, and hath burned up the sheep and the servants, and consumed them. And I only have escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there come another, and said, The Chaldeans made three bands, and fell upon the camels, and have carried them away. Yea, and slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only have escaped alone to tell thee. And while he was yet speaking, there come another also, and said, Thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking wine in the eldest brother's house. And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness, and smote the four corners of the house. And it fell upon 
upon the young men, and they are dead. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Then Job arose and read his mantle, and shaved his head, and fell down upon the ground and worshipped. And said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return hither to the Lord. Gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And all this Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. Now, can you imagine, folks? I mean, a lot of us have had some bad, bad things, right? Happened to us. I mean, we've all had some bad days for sure, but nothing like that. And you got to ask yourself, what would we do in that situation, right? Mm -hmm. <coughs> and unfortunately, Job's wife asked him to curse God and Doc, you know, right. as, as her remedy. But Job, you know, God was looking upon his heart. And all of Satan's boasting here, how Job would curse him to his face, didn't come to pass, did it? Well, if we go over to First Kings, and at First King, chapter eighteen, today you've got those that are professing Christians. They tell you how many times have you heard? I look. In fact, I got a neighbor, the professor. You know Bill, and uh, he's a professor retired. <laughs> Uh, math professor, and he well, he, he has a high IQ, so he professes himself to be a genius, and his children geniuses. <laughs> but he retired from the public school. Him and I used to, but well, we used to jog together, and then as the years went by, we walked together, and <laughs> and uh, so now we we, kind of, we don't do much anymore. Now you sit together. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but. Uh, Anyhow, we used to have some interesting arguments, and this fellow, uh, in the conversations, always would profess to be a Christian. He attended a United Methodist Church, and uh, but he believed in evolution, and uh, he believed in abortion for the black races that we were. So one day we were at home, and I, I was just kind of getting enough of him, and uh, just as we were getting back to my house. I told him, I says, you know, I can teach creationism and prove it in five minutes. You couldn't prove evolution to me in five years. And with that he said, well, how could you do that? And I said, it's not hard. I said, the Bible says God created heavens right there. God created the earth right there. God created men. Here we are. I said, you can touch me see me, you can hear me, right? I said, and we're here exactly that way. I said, I've never seen anything evolve, and you've never seen anything evolve. I don't know anyone that's ever seen anything evolve, and you don't know anyone that's ever seen anything evolve. I said, so, there's no evidence, right? He says, yes, but theoretically, <laughs> you are only here if people acknowledge you're here. If no one acknowledges you here, theoretically you're not here. <laughs> so I did the only thing that I could do. I got him in the headlock and I dug him at the top of his head. And he's yelling, ha, ah, stop, stop, because he didn't have much up there and he had less. My wife comes out on the back porch and she said, what in the world are you doing? I said, honey, I'm being acknowledged. <laughs> she said, I'm not here. <laughs> well, we never had that conversation again. <laughs> that was an interesting conversation. <laughs> Anyhow, starting over here in 1 Kings chapter 18, uh, you know, there are those old, old Elijah. You know, he's, he's brought three years of drought on the land, and old Ahab's been out looking all over for him, so finally he goes to meet Ahab. And uh, he says, well, why don't we just find out, okay, whose God is God? Let's have a contest out here. So Ahab sent all of the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together under Mount Carmel. And Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. And if Elijah, follow him. 
And the people answered him, not a word. Then said Elijah unto the people, I, even I, only remain a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Let them therefore give us two bullocks, and let them choose one bullock for themselves, and cut it in pieces, and lay it on wood, and put no fire under it. And I will dress the other bullock, and lay it on wood, and put no fire under it. And call you on the name of your gods, and I will call on the name of the Lord, the God that answereth by fire. Let him be God. And all the people answered and said, It is well spoken. And Elijah said unto the prophets of Baal, Choose you one bullock for yourselves, dress it first, for you are many, and call on the name of your gods, but put no fire under it. And they took the bullock which was given them, and they dressed it and called on the name of Baal from morning, evening, until noon. He said, Oh, Baal, hear us. But there was no voice, no <coughs> any that answered. And he leaped upon the altar which was made. And it came to pass at noon that Elijah mocked them. Now you see, Elijah's doing a little boasting here himself, but, but this is a positive boasting. And said, Well, cry aloud, for he is God. Either he's talking, or he is pursuing, or he is in a journey, or peradventure he sleepeth and must be awakened. And they cried aloud and cut themselves after the manner with knives and lances till the blood gushed out upon them. <coughs> and it came to pass when midday was past that they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice. And there was neither voice nor any answer, nor any that regarded. And Elijah said unto all the people, Come near unto me. And all the people came near unto him. And he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. By the way, it was Israel that broke those altars down. They had broken down all the altars. They kept going back and forth between God and Baal. And you see, old Jezebel, uh, she had 850 of the Baal worshippers. Then there was an, or 450. Then there was another 400 uh, that came to her table. And to those with, that ate at Jezebel's table, they would have these huge orgies. That's what they were. They were orgies in there. And he goes on, And Elijah took twelve stones, according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be thy name. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and made a trench about the altar as great as would contain two measures of seed. And he put the wood in order and cut the bullocks in pieces and laid them on the, the wood and said, Fill four barrels with water and pour it on burnt sacrifice and on the wood. And he said, Do it the second time and do it. And they did it the second time. And he said, Do it a third time. And they did it a third time. And the water ran about the altar and filled the trench also with water. And it came to pass at that time that the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came there and said Lord God of Abraham, Isaac and Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel and that I am thy servant and that I have done all of these things at thy word. Hear me O Lord, hear me that this people may know that thou art the Lord God and that thou hast turned their heart back again. And the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice. And the wood and the stones and, and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. And Elijah said unto them, Take the prophets of Baal. Let not one of them escape. And they took them. And Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon. And they slew them there. Well, here now. You see, Elijah's boasting, well, it proved out. Why? Because he had God's word on him. Okay. Well, God always honored the commitment of his servants. If he tells us to do something and we do it, will he always honor that? Will he ever leave us, forsake us? No, he doesn't. Well, I want to take you now over to a look at some bullies. Over in Nehemiah chapter 4. And here you've got Sanballat the Hornite. And 
Tobiah, the Ammonite, and Geshur, and the Arab. And uh, these guys were some bullies. They all hated the Jews, and much like today, the Muslims and the communists hate Christians and Jews today. That's right. And uh, along with the apostate church and uh, the media, everywhere you turn in the public school system, they're telling the young people you can't, you can't wear Christian. You can wear any kind of a T-shirt, yeah. but a Christian T-shirt. Some of you may have heard this week. Uh, or no, it was last week, I believe it was Thursday or Friday, you had a, they had a city council meeting there in Akron, and at the city council meeting they had 200 people decided that uh, no longer would they invoke the name of Jesus Christ at the end of a prayer, that uh, they were going to remove that, and you had this Jewish woman speaking up saying that uh, she, uh, when, when the name of Jesus Christ was invoked, then she was left out uh, of the meeting. Well, I, w I did some commentary, and if you go to Matthew chapter 10, in Matthew chapter 10, in verse 32, we read this, Matthew 10, verse 32. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him also will I deny before my Father which is in heaven. Think not that I am come to send peace on earth, I come not to send peace but a sword. Anyhow, so in the commentary, I said, I don't know this woman, but if I knew her, and we were associates, I would say to her, from this point on, I can never associate with you anymore. We have to break relations because what you're asking me to do is to betray my Lord. By, when you're telling me that we, by not invoking and not praying in the name of Jesus, that is denying my Lord. And you're asking me to do that. And if you would ask me to do that, I'm sorry, I cannot have any, any fellowship or any relationship with you. And I said, if anybody's out there listening, uh, and we have a lot of listeners in Akron, I said, and, uh, you know this woman, or just call it. In fact, if you know her, call her and tell her what we're talking about. I'm probably going to bring it up again during when I preach this message on the radio. But you see, you need to always be ready to give a good defense of Scripture. You see, there, the hypocrisy is unbelievable with these people. Uh, they like to dish it up, but they can't take it. And in Nehemiah here, but it came to pass that when Son Ballad heard that he that we bought building the wall, he was wroth and took great indignation and mocked the Jews. They just didn't want the Jews moving into the neighborhood. Now, here's the question. Who was it that gave that land where the temple was to the Jews to begin with? Uh -huh. Right? It belonged to them. They were run out. And now these guys are saying, does that sound familiar, Dr. Shannon? <laughs> <coughs> By the way, uh, I met Dave Nadel. Oh, did you? Dave was over at the, uh, I ran into him over at the uh, oh, good. symposium. Okay. And he said, I heard about your, your prophecy conference you're going to have. I said, yeah, I'm bringing in John McTurner. Uh -huh. He said, let's do it at the Jericho Center. We can, we can break, we can fit more people. So oh, wow. I said, uh, you know, let me, let me get a hold of uh, John and let's see if we can do that. Mm -hmm. we'll, will promote it. It doesn't give me a lot of time sure. to promote it. I might have to put it back a week or two. But, uh, okay. uh, it's going to be in April. Okay. Okay. But I have to, I might have to put it back a week. I have mm -hmm. a bunch of things coming up in April. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, one, uh, we have Resurrection mm -hmm. Sunday, so we don't want the Saturday before mm -hmm. Resurrection Sunday. Then I've got a, I'm going to be doing a wedding at the Ritz in Cleveland. So i got to see if we can schedule this in uh, the Prophecy Conference. And if you'd like to be a part of that, we'd like to have you. Uh, that would be great. And he spake before his brethren in the army of Samaria and said, What do these feeble Jews, will they fortify themselves or will they sacrifice? Will they make an end in, in that day? 
Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of the rubbish which are burned? Now, Tobiah, the Ammonite, it was by him, and he said, Even that which they built, when the fox go up, he shall even break down their stone wall. Hear, O our God, for we are despised. You see, they're, they're mocking Nehemiah and his people. And Nehemiah has cried out to God, We are despised, and turn their reproach upon their own head, and give them for a prey in the land of captivity. And cover not their iniquity, and let not their sin be blotted out from before thee, for they have provoked thee to anger before the builders. So built we the wall, and all the wall was joined together into half thereof, for the people had a mind to work. But it came to pass that when Sanballat and Tobiah and the Arabians and the Ammonites and the Ashtonites heard that the walls of Jerusalem were made up and that the breaches began to be stopped, that they were very wroth. It conspired all of them together to come in and to fight against Jerusalem to hinder it. Nevertheless, we made our prayer unto the God and set a watch against them day and night because of them. And Judah said, The strength of the bearers of burdens is decayed, and there is much rubbish, so that they, we are not able to build the wall. And so our adversaries said, They shall not know, neither shall see, till we come in in the midst among them, and slay them, and cause the work to cease. And it came to pass that when the Jews which dwelt by them came, they said unto us ten times, From all the places whence you shall return to us, they will be upon you. Therefore I sit in the lower places behind the wall. Now in the higher places even set the people after their families with their swords and with their spears and with their bows. And I looked and rose up and said unto the nobles and to the rulers and to the rest of the people, Be not you afraid of them. Remember the Lord which is great and terrible. And fight for your brethren and your sons and your daughters and your wives. Well, you see, uh, today you've got these prissy preachers talking pacifism, pacifism. And uh, they'll always quote, they know the verse, uh, turn the other cheek. You know, it's easier for them to say because they never get themselves involved in a situation where they have to do that. And I had a prissy preacher one time that was telling me that. Uh, he didn't know any place in the Bible where it said that he had to stand against the government and that he believed Romans 13 uh, says that we're to obey the government even even if it's a corrupt government. So as I was, we was walking out, I pitched him right on the backside. He turned around and said, I'm offended. I said, turn the other cheek. <laughs> and that was it. <laughs> but you know, and that's what these, these crazy preachers are. Look, when we have, on Thursday, we're having our Tea Party meeting, and the speaker there is going to be telling you, you see, what he was saying here was, we'll get in there, we'll be right amongst them, they won't even recognize us, we'll go in, we'll look like them, we'll come out through the heaps, looking like, like we're in there working too, and once we get amongst them, we'll destroy them. The speaker is going to be talking about Islam in this country. Okay. Believe me, they're everywhere. Right now, they're, they have uh, Islamic training camps, uh, Obama's Muslim Brotherhood. Do you know that they don't even have to go through the same things we have to in the airports? When they go through the airport, they have special passes in that Obama's Muslim Brotherhood that they go right through. Mm -hmm. okay. And they're opening Al-Qaeda training camps. Now, they don't call them Al-Qaeda, but that's what they are, all over. He's going to be showing you this Thursday night. They're at the uh, Tea Party meeting there in the West Woods. You really need to see that. You really need to be informed what's taking place. Uh, in fact, you might want to listen to him on the radio tomorrow night. But he will be there speaking on that. So that's at the Tea Party. If I were you folks, I'd find a way to get out there, because this is going to be very, very... You really need to know this. Anyhow, I wanted to go over to, to Esther. Now you see, old, uh, these fellows that tried to bully old ne Nehemiah, those folks weren't going to sit down and go away. They were ready to fight. And if you go over to Esther, uh, we see here that old Haman, well, 
he was boasting to all his friends that he's going to have this Mordecai, he's going to have him hung on his gallows, and then he's got permission as the second most powerful guy in the kingdom to eliminate all of these Jews. We're going to have a major slaughter. The Jews are going to be dead. Mordecai's going to be out of my way, and I'm going to be top dog around here. Well, it didn't quite work out that way. And we read in chapter 3, verse 1, After these things did King Azarus promote Haman, the son of Hamid, I thought the adjutant, and advanced him and set his seat above all the princes that were with him. And all the king's servants that were with him, and the king's gate bowed and reverenced Haman, for the king had so commanded concerning him. But Mordecai bowed not, nor did reverence. Then the king's servants which were in the king's gate said unto Mordecai, Why transgresses the king's command? Now it come to pass that they spake daily unto him, and he hearkened not unto them, and they told Haman to see whether Mordecai's matters would stand for. And they had told them that he was a Jew. And when Haman saw that Mordecai bowed not, nor did him reverence, then was Haman full of wrath. And he thought scorn to lay his hands on Mordecai alone, for they had showed him the people of Mordecai, wherefore Haman sought to destroy all the Jews that were throughout the whole kingdom. Well, you see here, old uh, Haman wanted to be, I mean, he wanted to be like the, the top dog. He was number one man here now. And Mordecai would, why would Mordecai not bow to him? Because he didn't bow to him. That was a, the Jew didn't bow or give reference, and he was a real Jew to uh, God. That was a part of worship. Bowing down was a part of worship. So, uh, and he didn't have to bow to the king because he never saw the king, huh? But anyhow, so, here now, Esther was. Uh, one of the prettiest queens that the king had. And Mordecai was her cousin, and he was also, uh, he kind of took her up under his wing and uh, ministered to her. So what happened now was there were a time when some of those in the king's cabinet had plotted to kill the king, and they were down by the gates, and Mordecai happened to be there, and he overheard everything they said, and he was a whistleblower, he blew the whistle on him, and that was put in the king's journal. Now, there was a day when uh, the king said, bring me forth my journal, and I want to see, <coughs> I want to go back and see who, who deserves to get rewards. And when he saw that, he said, what was what was ever done with this fella for blowing the whistle, whistle and saving my life? And they said, nothing. Well, now, here, when uh, the king called in Haman, he said, look, if I wanted to honor somebody, how would you honor him? If you really wanted to honor somebody, what would you do? Well, Haman thought it king was talking about him. And he said, well, this is what you do. Here is what you do. You put him on your horse, wearing your crown, wearing your robe, with your scepter, and you let him drive down, right down the middle of the street, and have all the people bow to him and sing praise to him. The king said, that's a great idea, Haman. He said, I want you to go and do that to Mordecai. <laughs> yeah. Well, can you imagine right about now, because here, Haman had been telling everybody he was going to get rid of this Jew, and now what is he doing, all right? And his whole family's upset by this time. So, Haman goes and he gets the uh, king, 
to sign an order to have all of the Jews killed throughout the land, to go post it all throughout the land to all the people, uh, to go ahead, and not only that, but to, he ordered the Jews not to resist. What do you think of that? So he said, we're gonna come kill you now, don't resist. Right. Hmm. So now, you have this order throughout the land to go <clears throat> kill all the Jews, and the army where it's going to back you up, the king's army. Well, oh Mordecai, he goes to Esther and says, look, Esther, you got to go before the king. Now, if you fail to do that, God will find a way to deliver his people. But you sure wish you had. You sure wish you'd have gone. So Esther prayed about that for a while. And then, you see, if you go before the king, he does, if he doesn't summon you and you go in there before the king, uh, you're taking a real chance. If he, does, if he does not summon you and you put in, if the king was to hold up his scepter, that means come on in, you're all right. But if he was to put it down, that meant you lost your head. And uh, Queen Esther had a pretty head, too, they say. Anyhow, so Esther goes and tells, talks to the queen, or the king, and tells the king, these are my people. You look, Haman wants to kill all of my people. And the king said, well, I didn't know that. But I, I already put my seal on that. I gave him my ring and I sealed it, that order. Well, then, the queen had a banquet. And Mordecai came to, or Haman came to her to beg her uh, to have mercy on him and not speak against him to the to the king. But she wouldn't. She refused him. Well then he got got a little beside himself and she was sitting on her bed and he came in and jumped on her bed begging her to to not uh, to go before the king and speak favorably of him. And the king came in and said you come right in my presence? You come up to my queen's bed? Guess what ended up happening on the gallows that he had built for Mordecai? Guess who got hung there? Haman and his whole family. Mm -hmm. But you see, that was the bullies of those days. and We have those bullies today. Everywhere you turn that German family, now they're allowed to stay here. But they try to push them back, knowing that the, the parents, the children, will be taken from the parents. Uh, all over the, the country today, they're telling you you can't pray in the name of Jesus. In the high schools, they're making the children if they, you know you can wear any kind of a T-shirt, but one that has a scripture verse on. Uh, everywhere you turn, you've got this anti-Christian bigotry out there, and folks, we are not supposed to take it. We're supposed to stand up and resist Amen. unto death. Well, I want to go now to to bastards. You know, you've got you've got the IRS, you've got the EPA. By the way, did you know that the EPA the EPA is giving classes teaching environmental wackos how to sue the EPA for money? After all, it's your money, it's your tax money. So they're actually giving workshops teaching. The environmental wackos, how to sue them so they can take your tax money and pay the wackos. Jesus. Insane. Huh? <laughs> insane. Well, uh, liberalism is insane. You've got the, the, the unions, the labor unions out there today. Yeah. Uh, you've got the uh, prison. Boy, the prison system is a real bad one where it comes to persecuting Christians. Anyhow, turn over to Hebrews chapter 12. And as we look at bastards, now, I'll bet I know for a fact that every one of you in here had a human father, right? Oh, man. You see? Okay. <laughs> for a fact, I know something else. This is why I'm the pastor here. There's only one person that we know for absolutely, positively, for sure was there when you were born. That was your mother, right? Yeah. You see, this is stuff you learn. That's yeah. 
Now, this, this is stuff that's much too complicated for a liberal. Uh, you know, this is just too much to take in. Now, here, you want to know something about that. See, we all have physical fathers, and but we all have fathers of the spirit, too, you see. Because when the physical fathers return to the dust, the father of light, our spiritual father, he doesn't change, right? He stays our father. Right. And this is where we read in verse 5. And have you forgotten the exhortation which speaketh to you as unto children? My son, despise not the chastising of the Lord, nor faith when thou were rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chastens, and scourges every son whom he receiveth. If you endure chastity, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chastised not? But if you be without chastisement, wherefore all are partakers, then are ye bastards, and not sons. Let me ask you this. Does Satan punish and reward his people for doing evil? People always say to me, you know, don't you get it? Look at these people out there. You talk about the very people that you talk about. Hey, you guys, you Christians are just jealous. The Bill Gates. And, you know, these guys are doing what they want. All of that money, you're just jealous that you don't have all that money out there, right? Right. Well, when you say, what does God allow? God allows the wicked a little pleasure for a short season. Right. See, that's as good as it's going to get for him. You know, all of Bill Gates' money is going to be nothing. He, all of his money, and if you combine that with Warren Buffett's money and everybody else, it won't buy you 10 minutes in heaven, will it? Right? It won't buy you 10 minutes in heaven. Do you think that Bill Gates would, would give every penny he owns to buy one minute out of hell? I, be I believe he would. Soros, too. George Soros, too, yeah. And here now, furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us. We gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? For verily, for a few days, chastised us for their own pleasure, but he for our own profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now, no chastisement for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yielded the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Wherefore, lift up thy hands which hang down and thy feeble knees, and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is laid be turned out of the, the way, but let it rather be healed. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Well, you know, I know a lot of people that are professing Christians, and yes, they harbor all kinds of bitterness. I mean, towards others who they call Christians. And, you know, usually you find out that those people have so many things in common. Often they're so much alike, and that's why they hold all of that bitterness towards each other. But it's an interesting thing, because bitterness can never, ever help you, but it can always hurt you. Amen. It can be like a cancer. It can eat you from the inside out. Right. It can never. Same thing with things like weary, you know, to worry. To worry can never help you, but it certainly can do a lot of damage to you. Amen? Amen. <coughs> well, you know how that afterward when you would have inherited the blessings he was rejected for he found no place of repentance though he sought it carefully with tears well I'm going to go sit down and do a few minutes of Bible question or answer when we come to this when we talk about uh, the, the father of spirits do, you, do you folks understand what that means what did Jesus say to the Pharisees? You don't know me because you don't know my Father. Had you known my Father, you would have known me. Because you're not of my Father, you're of your Father, the devil. Okay? So, if 
In fact, what happens? When our bodies go into the ground, and we read it over in 1 Corinthians, and they turn back to dust, what happens to our spirit? Our spirit goes to be with our Father. The Father is spirit stuff. So He keeps us, doesn't He? So we go to be with Him. Don't we? If you're saved, if you're not saved, well, you wish you were, huh? So, but today you, you see how what we have out there, everything that the world accuses us of, they're guilty of. And we are living in a time. This is why I keep trying to emphasize how important it is that everybody wakes up and gets involved now. You, you, we, we are out of time. We are out of, there's no time left. Our country, Dr. Shannon knows, you see where we're heading, don't you? He's a man that's been in the communist countries for a long time. Uh, you, you were, about three years ago, Brother Shannon, we had our UBF conference here in Cortland down the street. And we had ten pastors from Russia there. And they were saying, what is wrong with you people? What is wrong? Because we had, what, about 40 pastors over there? He said, don't you understand? And I said, yeah, we do understand. We do understand. We do know what you're talking about. They said, we, we left Russia to get away from this. And now it's here. Stop it while you can. I says, there's a few of us that, that are trying to do that, but they're entrenched already in all of the media. They're entrenched right now. So right now, it's for us, it's now or never. We got to stand up. We got to be kind. We got to storm the gates of hell. And like Winston Churchill said, even if even if there's no chance of survival anymore, it's better to perish than to live as slaves. So, all right. Any questions about all of what we just went over tonight? Well, usually you guys have all kinds of questions. Brother Shannon, did you want to uh, speak on anything to the people tonight? The average Russian Christian says simply that people in, from the United States are stupid. Yeah. <laughs> and the, the question that I get is, why are Americans so stupid? I had a, a student tell me one time, he just volunteered in class. He says, you know, when they take away your guns, you'll be just like us. Well, you see what's taking place right now in Connecticut and New Jersey? Uh, they passed this gun ban in Connecticut. And uh, yeah. there's some people who just decided, no, you know what, we're not going to turn our guns in. We're not going to do that. So they called the police department, and they had, now they didn't know. Oh, uh, World News Daily called the police, and they said, they they said, well, what if what if we decide not to turn our guns? In? Now the police didn't know they were being recorded, okay? and they made all kinds of threats, you know, uh, about you know we'll come to your house. We'll do this, we'll do that. This police state, that's absolutely police state. But there's an, a group of Connecticut guys said, you want our guns? Come and get them. You get them barrels blasted. Okay, and that, that group, they say there's probably close to 100,000 people in Connecticut that said, no, we're not going to turn our guns in. That ain't going to happen. So now, <coughs> an interesting thing, because in New Jersey, what is the most common gun you find in just in just about everybody's house? What's the first the first rifle? Shotgun. Guys? Shotgun. Well, twenty-two usually. Hmm. A twenty-two in New Jersey, they're just about to uh, to outlaw twenty-twos. Hmm. Uh, that's an interesting thing, right? That they, they start with one gun, okay, and then they just try to move it down the line. Uh, 
You don't give up your guns. This is why Matt Lynch, you see, Matt Lynch says, look, we don't have to, we should not have to have a license for concealing carry. Uh, there's none of the other amendments, none of the other amendments are qualified by any kind of a license. Why should the second amendment be? Okay. And so he's trying, he put together a bill to outlaw that in Ohio, but because of the rhinos, you know, listen to this. We have a Republican-controlled House, a Republican-controlled Senate, and we're supposed to have a Republican in, in the governor's mansion. So virtually any kind of a bill that passes should go right through. Is they, you know, they got veto-proof people, you know. Besides that, they don't have to. They got the governor, right? But it doesn't. Why can't we get any legislation passed? Solomon said, money answereth all things. It depends on the lobbying groups out there and uh, who can pay to play. Mike, did you have to, did you want to address well, I was just going to say, you know, in talking to some of the guys that I talked to in the prisons, they'll tell you, you know, they just love gun control. They love it because the black market just soars. I mean, they can make all the, I've seen, you know, and before I was a Christian, I was seeing trunkfuls and truckfuls of handguns and things. This was 30 years ago. I mean, they can make all the gun laws they want. Outlaws will always have their guns. They, I was at a funeral right here in uh, Bristol. And it was with the, uh, they buried one of their guys from the Brothers Regime, an outlaw group who Brother Jim here used to be, before he got saved, used to be part of. And after the funeral, they, they had a, it wasn't a 21-gun salute, it was like a 75-gun salute. All handguns came out of the women's purses, they shot them off, and they threw a bomb off the, at the funeral. But I mean, it's like, you know, they, it's just, it's such a joke in the sense of, you know, and they're the, that's the only time criminals will love voting to get more and more. They want them, they want that gun laws to, because they get so much money for handguns, it's ridiculous. It's an amazing thing. If you go to the cities like Chicago and Detroit and San Diego, where they have the, and Washington, D.C., where they have the, the, the toughest gun laws, guess where they have the highest crime? The highest murder yep. rates, too. That's right. The highest murder rates. Right. Uh, we have more people in Chicago we lost every year than we do our soldiers in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. We lose more than a kill by guns. Now, you see, me being a, a conservative person, I'd figure, well, if we have the strictest gun laws here and the murder rate rises, it could be that these guys that are killing people, well, they're not going out and registering their guns. <laughs> right. And I'd be willing to bet that if a cop pulled them over, before they shot the cop, they wouldn't say, you see, here's my concealed carry license, mm -hmm. and then shoot the cop. More than likely, they wouldn't have a concealed right. carry license at all, would they? But you see, remember, common sense and liberals are not compatible. That's right. Man, okay? Right. Common sense and liberalism. Now, you know, we're saying that, but that's their goal. That's obvious the goal is to disarm the people. <clears throat> Butch Reno said that. She said, gun registration is only to be gun and confiscation is the ultimate goal. Mm. Answer that uh, Second Amendment says a well-regulated militia being necessary, I think, it says to the free yeah. security of a free state, the rights of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. But there's uh, that has to be explained to people. They think uh, that I hear people say that militia means oh, only it's not people. It's it's a militia of government. No. Have you heard that one? Yeah, I've heard it. They, they call them the National Guard, the militia. It's not. Okay, I, is that it? The militia was any man between the ages of, of 18, what was it, 18 and 64, so it's 18 and all males between the ages. Right. You know, that's another thing. <laughs> they got all these women in combat, now they want to put women in combat. Right. So they started putting them in combat, and they, these women that are going into combat are refusing to fight. Only 8% of them that have signed up said they'd be willing to fight. 
<laughs> wow. Can you imagine you, you getting into a war, right? And uh, you yeah. go in there, uh, any of you ladies willing to fight today? You know? <laughs> now, who can tell me, who can tell me why these women don't want to fight? It's not their nature. You mean to tell me so? They're a woman. They're not. They're not made to.